In this fourth and last session today, we'll be mainly looking at how to integrate this shamatha practice in daily life. But first, I'd like to re reiterate this importance of establishing a basis in relaxation. So we'll look at that topic again. And on that basis, I'll introduce a practice using the Shavasana posture for relaxation. It's a, a posture that I use quite often. You may find helpful when you go home. After that, we'll look at some general advice regarding this practice, some daily practice advice, and then some resources that we can use to help us in this practice. And then Q&A is normal. But I want to go back again to this idea of relaxation. Um, again, this is not really mentioned in the old meditation text because I think people were pretty relaxed in those days. But it's something we really need to pay attention to in the modern world. So again, using that analogy from attention revolution, that we first need to sink these deep roots of relaxation to support the trunk of stability and the branches and leaves of clarity. Without those deep roots, our practice will completely collapse. And so, and here in his attention revolution, uh, he talks a bit about this and he says the following. One traditional Tibetan doctor whom I know once commented on people living in the West. And he's quoting the Tibetan doctor here who says, from the perspective of Tibetan medicine, you are all suffering from nervous disorders. But given how ill you are, you are coping remarkably well. Whether we dwell in Boston, Buenos Aires, Berlin or Beijing, our minds are conditioned to be more high strung and engaged in compulsive thinking than the minds of Tibetan nomads and farmers living a century ago. So when Tibetan meditation manuals advise beginners to, quote, focus their attention firmly, the instructions are aimed at a very different reader than the average city dweller in the 21st century. Before we can develop attentional stability, we first need to learn to relax. And some of us are really wound up very tight in the body and the mind. So even sitting, up, sitting upright, Find, we find it very difficult to really relax because it's it's the upright posture is supporting that tension. So what we can use as an alternative is the Shavasana posture, like the corpse posture from yoga. And so I'd like to introduce that by again reading from Attention Revolution regarding the Shavasana posture because the Shavasana posture, lying flat on your back, very conducive for relaxation. Also, if you want to meditate, but you're tired, sick, or injured, you may find this is the only posture to use. And also, as we're going to see, we can use the Shavasana posture as a transition to sleep. And we'll explain that shortly. But first, in the Tension Revolution, Alan Wallace says the following. Although Buddhism generally encourages cross-legged meditation, <laughs> the Buddha encouraged his followers to practice in any of four postures, walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. Any of these positions is per perfectly suitable. Not everyone living in the modern world has the same type of mind or nervous system. If you tend toward excitation, you may find lying down especially helpful for relaxing the tightness and restlessness of your body and mind. But if you're more prone to laxity, i.e. dullness, you may simply fall asleep whenever you lie down. So it may be necessary for you to be upright when meditating. So again, we can check. If we're trying a lot of agitation, tension, stress, Shavasana may be very good for us. But if we're the sort of person that naturally gets very dull and drowsy, maybe Shavasana posture is not for you for meditation. You just fall asleep. He says, lying down can also be very useful for meditation if you're physically tired but not re yet ready for bed. In this case, you may not be able to rouse yourself to sit upright in a posture of vigilance, but the prospect of lying down for a while may be inviting. <clears throat> Surrender to your body's need to rest and use the supine position to calm the mind as well. This likely will be much more refreshing and soothing than watching television or reading a newspaper. The supine posture may be your only option if you're ill, injured, or frail. It may be especially useful for meditation by those in hospitals, senior care facilities, and hospices. Mindfulness of breathing is great for preparing your mind for mental training, but it also can help you fall asleep. 
So here we, he's talking about how to use Shavasana posture to help us to fall asleep. He says, if you suffer from insomnia, the above method can help release tension in your body and mind when you go to bed at night. And if you wake up in the middle of the night and have a hard time falling back asleep, mindfulness of breathing can help you disengage from the thoughts that flood the mind. According to recent studies, about 80% of Americans are chronically sleep deprived. So all, if even if all this practice does is help you catch up on your sleep, that's worth a good deal. <clears throat> so again, we can use, if we have a lot of tension tightness in general, we can use the Shavasana posture as our meditation posture in the morning or any time of day. But again, if we're the sort of person who naturally gets more drowsy and laxity, probably that's not a good posture to, for you to use. It, you're better to sit upright. But also we can use it for helping a full sleep because often um, what happens is at the end of the day, maybe we've had a busy, hectic day and a time of going to bed, our mind is still buzzing with all sorts of things from the day, a lot of tension in the body. We lie down, we're tossing, turning, agitation, tension, and can't get to sleep. So what we can do then instead is go into the Shavasana posture, lying flat on your back, and just in every out breath, releasing any tension in the body, releasing thoughts in the mind, just keep relaxing and releasing. And you do that for as long as you can maintain some alertness when you notice you're becoming drowsy, you mentally know, you mentally know, okay, my meditation is finished. And then you physically move out of that posture into whatever posture you use for sleep. And then also sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night and we don't get back to sleep immediately. We go, oh, I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. I've got to work tomorrow. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. I've got to sleep. And of course, <laughs> we don't sleep. So again, if that's the case, shove us in a posture, relaxing, releasing everything. And even if you don't fall asleep quickly, because you're now so relaxed in the body and the mind, you're getting a lot of the benefits of sleep anyway. So it can be very helpful for, uh, for the transition to sleep as well. So what I'd like to do is just briefly describe how to do the Shavasana posture meditation. We don't have room for everyone to lie down. Normally, if I'm teaching this and there's lots of space, I get people to actually do the Shavasana, but here we don't have the space. So I'll just explain the practice. We'll do a meditation based on that explanation, but sitting upright. So then you have, you know what to do when you go home. So again, Shavasana posture is you're lying flat on your back. Your feet are slightly apart, your arms slightly away from the body and your palms facing upward. If you have them downward, it's sort of closing the shoulders. If you have them up, that sort of opens the shoulders as well. Um, and what we're doing is we're focusing on just either the rhythm of the breath or just the sensations of breath throughout the body. So just emphasizing that relaxation. So again, on every out breath, we're just relaxing and releasing any tension in the body, releasing any thoughts in the mind. We're just keeping, we're just doing that. Um, and if we're using it as a transition for sleep, then when you're in bed doing that, at the point where you notice you're really getting drowsy, you mentally note, okay, my meditation is finished and you physically move out of that posture. Now, most people, when they first use the Shavasana posture for meditation, they get they fall asleep very quickly. Or Why? Because we have a mental association. Lying flat means sleep. Whereas if we simply use the Shavasana for meditation, then after a few times of doing that, we'll start to build up a mental association that this particular flat position doesn't mean sleep, it means meditate. So then we can really start to meditate well without getting drowsy. But usually for most people, that's a, that mental association, horizontal means sleep. <laughs> um, so what we'll do is we'll just do the meditation now based on that instruction so that you have it to go home. So again, with this meditation, just emphasizing relaxation. So find a nice comfortable posture. Let's do that practice.
And so with the Shavasana posture, it's always good to put a little cushion under your head. And also sometimes people find it helpful to place something under their knees so the leg is not hyperextending. And also if it's a bit cool at home, you might like to put a blanket or a sheet over your body to keep a little bit warm. And then as normal, we begin with preparing the body. And so allowing the awareness to descend into the body. And simply becoming aware of sensations throughout the body. And if you notice any areas of tightness or tension in any part of the body, then use the out breath to relax and release that tightness or tension. And relaxing more deeply with each out breath. And bringing your attention to the area of your face, softening and relaxing all the muscles in the face. Mouth and jaw, soft and relaxed. And all the muscles around the eyes, soft and relaxed. And in this way, allowing the entire body to become completely relaxed, completely at ease. and allowing the breathing to settle into its natural rhythm. Simply allowing the breath to flow naturally and effortlessly. Simply get out of the way and let the body breathe itself. And with each out breath, letting go of whatever thoughts may have arisen. Happily releasing them. Releasing them into space. and simply allow the mind to come to rest. Not doing anything at all. <clears throat> so 
simply being present. Resting in the stillness of the present moment. And from that stillness, start to gently notice the sensations of the breath in any part of the body where you most easily notice these sensations. And continuing to relax and release any thoughts on the out breath. And arousing your focus on the in breath. Maintaining that ongoing flow of mindfulness of the sensations of the breath throughout the body.
And if you're using the Shavasana posture to meditate at home, rather than abruptly sitting up from that posture at the end of the meditation, it's better to first bend the left knee, then to roll over onto your right side. And when you're ready, use your hands to gently push yourself into a seated upright position. So just a few, first a few tips for using the Shavasana posture at home. <clears throat> um, whether you're, if you're using it just for a normal meditation now, um, because if you're lying down, usually you have ceiling light and if you meditate with your eyes open, it might be quite bright. So you might like to switch off any ceiling lights, have it softly lit or even maybe dark if you don't get drowsy. Again, if it's a little bit cold when you're meditating Shavasana posture, you can put a shawl or a blanket over you to keep a little bit warm. A small cushion under the head is usually pretty good. And as I mentioned in the meditation, sometimes lying flat out, the knees hyperextend a bit of pain in the knees. You can put something underneath the knees so they're a little bit bent. That might You might find that comfortable. Again, palms, not down, but facing upwards because that opens the shoulders, easier to breathe. And as I mentioned, when you come out of the Shavasana posture at home, you don't just abruptly sit up, but bend your left knee, roll over onto your right side, and then use your hands to gently push yourself to a seated upright position. And as I mentioned earlier, if you've never done this sort of meditation before, you probably find you get very drowsy because your mental association is flat, lying flat means sleep. But if you continue to do this and only use the Shavasana posture for meditation, you'll build up a mental association that this particular posture means meditation, not sleep. Um, and also very good to use this if you want to meditate, but you maybe are very agitated and tense in the body or you're very tired, physically tired. It's hard to sit upright. You can use Shavasana posture. Typically, when I'm doing more meditation retreat setting, towards the end of the day, I will only use Shavasana posture. Uh, and I find it very, very helpful. And as we saw, um, we can use this as a transition to sleep to help us to get to sleep. <clears throat> Any questions about Shavasana before I move on to the general advice? Actually, I had one question earlier from the Zoom that I didn't answer in the last session. So let's look at that now. The question was, uh, compulsive thoughts can be mitigated by observing the thoughts. So instead of getting caught up, you can observe them. That's correct. The sixth condition, remember we to uh, the prerequisite was to abandon or eliminate compulsive thinking. This is a contemporary understanding of mindfulness rather than the classical. That's okay. Not quite. Um, so here, when we say observing thoughts, then as an object of mindful of the shamatha practice, we're not, the classical idea of mindfulness is just be aware of whatever's arising in the present moment, which is not just thoughts, but the five sense fields as well. So you have all six sense spheres that you're, you're being non-judgmental towards as the way the modern mindfulness is moving, working. But here, when we say observe thoughts as shamatha practice, we're excluding the five sense fields. We're not paying attention to any sensory input. We're narrowing it down. So this is this is we're focusing on a single object. The single object is whatever's arising in the mental field, not the sense field. Um, any questions before we move on to the next topic? Anything about Shavasana? Um, wait, on, there might have been another question here. Um, okay. So let's review what we've covered today yeah you had actually the meditation is more to with the mental uh, consciousness but uh, you say when we observe the sensation of the breath then it is a physical sensation in a way yeah correct how do you reconcile these two ideas right um so meditation is done with the mental consciousness and so we are 
And with that mental consciousness, the sensory input is also input into that mental consciousness. But actually you'll find that in shamatha practice, even though we're using, say, the physical sensations of the breath, on those nine stages, as we move along those nine stages, actually you will find your sense faculties will shut down, will become dormant, which means actually um, before you achieve shamatha, you won't sense the breath anymore because that sense faculty is shut down. So how do we continue? Fortunately, if we're using the breath, what happens is what's called uh, acquired sign or in, in the Theravada tradition, nimitta. What happens there is that due to our focus, then you have a mental image appearing in your mind relating to the air element, which is the, is the, is the breath. Yeah? That's not something we generate. It's something that spontaneously arises. And that, that mental image can be very different from person to person. Sometimes it's some sort of blue light. Sometimes a star can be many different things appearing, but it will appear naturally. You, you don't generate it. And when it appears, you shift from the physical sensations to that mental image. And you use that the rest of the way to shamatha. Okay. So let's briefly review what we've covered today. Prerequisites we looked at last session. How, those six prerequisites, how to set up our day to support this practice. And then the actual practice, there's meditation and what we do between sessions. So the actual meditation, we looked at how to prepare body, speech, and mind, which we do in all meditation sessions. And then the actual shamatha practice, we looked at the qualities to cultivate, relaxation, stability, clarity, to emphasize them in this order. It's only on the basis of relaxation, we can develop stability. It's only on the basis of stability, we can develop clarity. So it's in this order. Uh, and then what to focus on, we use the breath. Um, many Buddhist traditions emphasize the breath, but also we briefly touched on using the mind as the object and using awareness as, as an object as well. Uh, and in, one, in some Tibetan traditions, they use mental image of a Buddha. This is all okay. Um, tools to use, two tools, rope of mindfulness, holding the object, hook of introspection, quality control. The faults and how to overcome them, we looked at laziness, forgetfulness, laxity, excitation, non-application, application, how to, to deal with that. And so one topic left then is how to integrate this into daily life. Because if we want any practice to develop, we need to do both meditation and then we need to do something to support that the rest of the day. Because sometimes I hear people talking amongst themselves and one will say to the other, when do you do your practice? And the other one will say, oh, I do it every morning at 6.30 for 30 minutes or an hour. So if that is our, our idea of practice, we're not going to get very far. Because even if we diligently meditate 30 minutes or even an hour every morning, but then we jump up and run around like crazy for the rest of the day mindlessly, then which is going to win out? 14 hours of reacting mindlessly or 30 minutes of mindful meditation? I think uh, it will get sort of squashed. So therefore, the mindfulness meditation at the beginning of the day will give us a good platform to start the day so we need to bring that into the day and continue to work on that and then that will feed back into the meditation so that's what i'd like to look at now um, is how to integrate that into daily life uh, but first some general advice uh, when to meditate daily meditation is the best we need to develop a habit um, and early morning is usually the best for most people to meditate because it's usually quiet. They have some time. They haven't filled up their day already. Their mind is generally fresh, if assuming we've got enough sleep. And also it's a good way to start the day with, in that positive way. What I would recommend is to meditate the same time each morning. Because one of the most difficult things to having a daily practice is simply develop the habit. And if you're changing the time when you meditate, you're not really developing a habit. But let's say you say, okay, I'm going to meditate every morning at 6.30 for 30 minutes. Then, then you know, make sure you start at 6.30. Um, and so then what, what would be helpful is to set challenges. And so first say, okay, for the next week, 
I'm going to meditate every morning at 6.30. Once you've done that a few times, then you can say, okay, for the next 30 days, I'm going to meditate at 6.30 every morning. Because studies show, I think, that to start to develop a habit, we need to do things at least 25 to 30 days in a row to develop, start to develop a habit. Once we've developed a habit, then it becomes sort of more automatic, easier. Um, if you want to meditate in the evening, um, great. Um, also, you can use it as a transition to sleep. And one thing that's good to do in the evening is to reflect on your day. Like, let's say you go to bed. Actually, this is a very good thing to do. You go to bed, you go into the Shavasana posture, and then, and this will come up in a slide shortly, then you just look back on your day. How did my day go? And then you pick maybe one not so good thing you did during the day. And then you, what you do is you purify it. So you acknowledge it. You have sincere regret for having done that. You think of some sort of remedy for that. And you make a strong determination not to do that again the next day. So just pick one. But equally important, maybe more important, because unfortunately in our modern world, we have this obsessive focus on the negative. And we know this well. You know, if in our day, 95% of the things we did were really good and 5% not so good, what do we do at the end of the day? Oh, geez, I was an awful person today. Awful person today. Even though only 5% was not so good, 95% was good because we focus on that. So we really need to focus on the positives. So therefore, pick one good thing we did during the day and really be happy about having done that and make a strong determination to continue that good behavior the next day. And the third thing I think we can do in the reflecting on the day is practice gratitude. It really can shift our perspective of life, is to really pick, think of one thing that we received during the day and from other people or all the world around us. And we receive a lot of things all the time and really be grateful for that. And that can really shift our perspective as well. So that's something we can do at the evening at least that, if we're not going to meditate a formal session, just do that. And then we can do the transition to sleep with it and we can release everything and so forth. Where to meditate. So what we saw earlier in the prerequisites, um, quiet place. So ideally at home, if you have a spare room, you can, as a meditation room, close the door, particularly if you've got family members, close the door, that's meditation space. If you don't have that luxury of a spare room, then a corner of a room. And make it comfortable and inviting. Nice cushion, nice place to sit and so forth. Um, and then make it yeah, very clean and inviting because then it can inspire us. You know, sometimes people have a picture of some person they really admire. Uh, put that in there if that really helps to uplift the mind to inspire you. How long to meditate? So as I mentioned earlier, as a beginner, don't try and meditate too long because we're not going to be able to sustain it. You don't, as a beginner, to think, okay, I'm going to meditate one hour every morning. You know, maybe we'll do 10 or 15 minutes and then the other 45 minutes, we'll just sit there sort of looking at our watch. When is it going to end and daydreaming and, and that, that is a waste of time. So how short to begin depends on us as a individual. So here we did in these sessions were 12 minutes. I just sort of picked 12 minutes, uh, fit nicely with this program. But for some people, maybe 10 is good to start with, 15 or 20. But pick something that you can uh, sustain. If your normal experience is that before the time, you have a timer, before the time's up, you're going, when's it going to finish? When's it going to finish? I've had enough, I've had enough. Then you're meditating too long. Um so cut it down and then, but of course, if we want to progress over time, we'll need to extend it because if you're only ever meditating 10 minutes in the morning, you're not going to make a lot of progress long-term. So when to extend is when your normal experience is that at the end of your meditation session, your normal experience is, oh, I would have liked to have done a little bit longer. If that becomes your normal experience, then you can extend, but don't go from 10 to 20 three to five minute increments. So if you're doing 15, go to 20, say. So just slowly increase. Um, and as I mentioned, use a timer for the reasons I mentioned earlier. If you don't use a timer, 
then if it's a difficult morning, you'll give up and you'll have the, you won't develop perseverance. On other days, when you are, it's going well, you will keep meditating until it not go, till it doesn't go well, and then you'll stop. And that's what you remember. So um, use a timer. It'll help to cultivate perseverance and, and keep enthusiasm to meditate. What to meditate on? Um, in this today, we've focused on one practice only, the shamatha practice. And I think for many of us in the modern world, at least initially, that's a practice we probably need to emphasize a lot because many of us don't have very good attention skills. Um, and so if we put a lot of effort into other practices without those attention skills, we're not really going to make any much progress. So I would recommend for most of us to emphasize initially some shamatha practice, to calm the mind, to focus the mind and, and use the object that works best for you. We use the breath, but you may like to use another object. But it's very helpful, whatever system of practice we're using, to have an integrated approach. Because if we only do shamatha practice, that's a little bit unbalanced. It would be like, you know, we have the three main, three or four main food groups, only eating one food group. That's not balanced. So, I think the sort of the other, there are many areas of meditation, but the other two main areas of meditation which fit nicely on shamatha is what's called wisdom and compassion, the two main wings of practice. So those three main food groups, I think, would be very helpful to focus on. Um, and as I mentioned already a couple of times today, that all of that is based on what's called the preliminaries. You know, that otherwise, if we don't do those sort of preliminaries, we're going we're going to be either very lazy because we don't see we want to be doing other things or we're going to be caught up in chasing sensory pleasures. So with those preliminaries, um, they like precious human reflecting on our precious human life, death and impermanence. And the source of happiness is not out there. It's within ourselves. If we focus on those as well, that's the foundation for the shamatha and the two wings of wisdom and compassion. So what I would recommend is, even though maybe we do a, a main practice of shamatha to really calm the mind, focus the mind, then I would add some of these other practices in as well. And there we can be flexible on what we do, depending on what's going on in our life. So for example, I've given a couple of examples here. If we find that we have a lot of apathy, we feel disconnected or low self-esteem, then the compassion wing, particularly cultivating loving kindness and compassion for ourselves and others, very helpful. If we find we have a lot of jealousy of others, we're feeling a lot of despair, then I would recommend what's practice called empathetic joy, rejoicing in the good fortunes of ourselves and others. If we find that when it comes to meditation, we're too lazy or too busy to meditate, then as we saw earlier, I very much recommend reflecting on our precious human life and death and impermanence. <clears throat> we got precious opportunities, not going to last forever. Let's not waste it. And then if you find you're chasing after a lot of sense pleasures, then really reflecting on, as we saw earlier, impermanence, that these all these sensory pleasures are just fleeting. They're never going to fulfill us. They're never going to satisfy us. And then together with that, to reflect on the view of happiness. The genuine happiness is not to be found anywhere out there. It comes within our own mind. So those sort of practices can be very helpful for those reasons. And when we're doing these sorts of practices, what can be very helpful at the beginning is to listen to guided meditations because some of these other practices have a, quite a number of steps involved. So you can listen to the guided meditation to learn the practice. But then what I would recommend is stop listening to the, because other, otherwise at some point you're going to hit the play button and it's going to be sort of automatic pilot. You're sort of kind of listening, but you're not. And you're just thinking about the rest of the day. So once you've learned the practice, you don't need to guide, you do it yourself. And we need to make effort. Um, in this practice, but effort doesn't mean push hard. Um, in fact, the word effort coming from Sanskrit and Tibetan, the definition is a mind that delights in virtue, a mind that's happy to do good things. So if you see the benefits of doing these things, you'll happily do it and it actually becomes effortless. So therefore, um, 
we always need to keep a joyful mind in practice. If our mind is not joyful, if we go, oh, I've got to push hard, I've got to get this done, to... then we've completely gone astray because we don't understand that this is going to benefit us no matter how difficult it is. So we have a joyful mind because we understand even if this is difficult, it's really going to benefit us. So this is very important to keep this joyful mind. And the key to progress is continuity, meaning not only a daily meditation practice, but continuing to cultivate what we do in the morning for the rest of the day. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. And one other thing is to avoid unrealistic expectations. Um, often people feel like, and I fell into this mistake many years ago, that, you know, if I gather a lot of knowledge about Buddhist practices, somehow if I get all that knowledge and I go home, my life will automatically change. It won't. Intellectual knowledge won't change anything. In fact, it may make you feel more desperate because you think you got the answer and nothing's improving in my life. So our behavior is not driven by our intellectual understanding. It's driven by our instinctive habits. So what we need to do is bring that intellectual knowledge into experience through meditation and integrating into daily life. Then it become a, it can become our experience, not just it's just not knowledge. It's actually then wisdom, experienced wisdom. Then our life will start to change. Knowledge is different than wisdom. Wisdom is to experiential. Life. Well, experiential knowledge is intellectual. intellectual. I mean, we need that to develop wisdom, but if we just leave it as intellectual knowledge. In fact, we could be the smartest Buddhist scholar on the planet and be completely miserable, completely miserable. So we need to bring it here. And that's what we do with meditation and integrating into daily life. Um, and also another unrealistic expectation is people think, okay, every day, every week, my practice should go like this. Every week, it should get a little bit better, 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 like this. I don't know anyone's practice who does that. In the short term, it's like this lot of up and down. So we need to have a long-term perspective and not think next week my practice is going to be better than this week. It may not be. We may have a lot more agitation next week than this week. Who knows? But in the long term, when we're talking years, if we're practicing well, we should notice an improvement. But that improvement generally happens very gradually, so much so that we experience that very gradual change every day. We don't notice it. But maybe someone we haven't seen for six months comes and says, wow, you've really changed a lot in the last six months. And we go, no, I haven't. You have, but you don't notice it because it's very gradual. Um, also, we're going to be faced with many difficulties in our life as we do now. And we can have two perspectives here. We can either see difficult situations as problems and obstacles and have aversion and make them bigger and get overwhelmed. That's one option. Or we can see difficult situations as opportunities for growth as a person. In fact, if we look at our lives, generally the time where we develop most as a person is not when things are going well. We just sort of float along. Nothing really happens. It's only when we're faced with challenges that really force us or help us to grow as a person. So difficult situations are not problems. They're opportunities. I'm not saying they're not difficult. They're difficult but they, they're fuel for us to grow as a person to develop. And if we can make that shift, we won't magnify them, we won't get overwhelmed, we'll be able to work through them in a better way. And lastly, again, I can't overemphasize this point of Sangha, spiritual community, that if we really want to make some changes in our life, my experience tells me in talking to many people, if we just want to, if we have this attitude, I can do it by myself, I think you're going to find it very difficult, if not impossible. Um, so find these like-minded people, either in a Buddhist center such as this, or just people in where you live, around by. Get connected, meet together, support each other, help each other. Very, very helpful. Very, very important. So now some daily practice advice. And it's very good to start the day with a good motivation. And here's one from the Dalai Lama I very much like. He says, every day, think as you wake up, I'm going to benefit others as much as I can. Um, because I think in our modern world, we have we sort of tend to have this obsessive focus on ourselves 
And we usually focus on the negative aspects of ourselves. So we really, that's why we have lo a lot of low self-esteem and self-hatred and so forth. So really to bring that motivation out, I want to benefit others as much as I can. I think this is a very good way to start the day with this sort of motivation. And as I mentioned, um, very helpful to start the day with the meditation practice first thing, um, same time, form the habit, quality over quantity, don't try and do too much as a beginner. Um, again, shamatha, I would recommend emphasizing, but not just doing that, but having an integrated approach. So some days you may find you're feeling a bit sort of low self-esteem and so forth. So then you maybe stay with, start with a bit of five minutes of shamatha to calm the mind. And then you do a sort of loving kindness or compassion practice for yourself and others as an example. And then during the day, we need to bring this practice into daily life. So for, for today, we're emphasizing shamatha practice. So we're in, in meditation, we are strengthening our mindfulness. We are cultivating mindfulness. We are making so we can hold the object better. So we need to continue to cultivate mindfulness throughout the day. Um, and we could do... We could just say, okay, I'm going to be my, as mindful as possible throughout the day. We could say that at the beginning of the day, probably after five minutes, we've forgotten that. So we need to help us, to remind us to be mindful, use triggers. So triggers can be various things like every time you notice you're tense, that's the trigger. You go, okay, I'm feeling tense now. Stop whatever I'm doing and just sit there and focus on the breath for three breaths or so forth to calm the body. That's a trigger. So then we're mindful. There are apps, mindfulness apps that do the same thing that every so often give you a little bell. So whatever you do, you stop and you just do a little breathing exercise, for example. Also, you can use a smartwatch for the same reason. Um, and then during the day, as we saw, to let go of compulsive thinking to really be present with everything we do. And here's a very nice quote I, uh, from Viktor Frankl, who says, between stimulus and response, there is, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and freedom. Now there's a space, we, don't, we can't take advantage of it because we're not mindful. Because what happens is stimulus comes and then we simply react out of habit. And often our reactions are not very good. That space may only be half a second or less. And without mindfulness, we won't be able to catch that space. There'll be stimulus, we react, stimulus, react. We're basically stimulus reaction machines. We'll be stuck. But if we cultivate shamatha meditation and we actively practice mindfulness through the day, we'll be able to start to catch that space. And then, as Viktor Frankl said, instead of reacting out of habit, we can choose our response. Stimulus comes, we observe that, we notice it, and then instead of reacting out of habit, we choose a better response. And that's where we grow, and that's where we have freedom. But we need mindfulness for that. So we need to cultivate that in meditation. We need to bring that into daily life. So we need to develop this witnessing mode, to have this window of opportunity. Instead of reacting out of habit, to respond in a better, better way. So we can respond instead of reacting with attachment and aversion, we can respond with loving kindness and compassion. We have that freedom if we can, um, if we can gain access to that space. That's what Viktor Frankl is saying. And we do that through shamatha practice and actively working on mindfulness through the day. And at the end of the day, um, as I mentioned, if you want to do another meditation, fine. But at least what we all can do is when we go to bed, is go into the Shavasana posture, review the day. And as I mentioned, pick one negative thing, which I didn't put on the slide because I want to focus on the positive. Maybe one not so good thing during the day, regret that, strong determination not to do it again. But at least to focus on the positives because we don't do that in our modern world. One positive action, Pick one positive thing we did during the day. Rejoice, be happy about that. Resolve, make a strong determination to continue that good behavior the next day. And then gratitude. Pick one thing we received during the day and have gratitude for having received that. That can really shift our perspective. And then as I saw, as I mentioned, we can use the Shavasana then to transition to sleep. 
particularly if we have a lot of agitation and tension in the body and the mind from the day, just in that Shavasana posture, relaxing, releasing, relaxing, releasing, until you notice you're drowsy, then mentally, then mentally note meditation's finished, physically move into whatever posture for sleep. And then lastly, some resources. So if you're really interested in knowing a lot more about the Shamatha practice, I highly recommend this book. I quoted a number of times, The Attention Revolution from Alan Wallace. Very, very good book. Um, also uh, on my website, you can see there, glensvenson.org. I've got a, lots of recordings from all sorts of things. I often do a lot of shamatha um, programs, retreats, short talks, day think workshops like this. So you can find that under the, the recordings there, particularly the latest lot since 2020. Um, and then if you want to contact me, I've also got a contact page on that website. Um, so that's all I really wanted to uh, cover today. So we've got a little bit of time for Q&A before we wrap up today. Any questions? Yeah. In the book, attention to uh, attention revolution. Yeah. One of the techniques is awareness and awareness. Mm -hmm. I had a hard time figuring that out. Figuring uh, it out, yeah. And um, because I can't differentiate between that and the, the the second one that he's recommending, which is just resting in awareness. So. Well, the sick. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's one, and the other part. Well, let me the, answer that first. I think it might be related. So, okay. So. Um, like when you go from a objective meditation to non dual subjective, yeah, non dual kind of meditation, how do you uh, sort of turn that in? If like from the point of view where your awareness is looking outside of the object to the point where you're looking at the object, but even when you do that, when you when you turn it inwards, you're still uh, hard to describe, but you're still looking. Right. So. Right. Um, yeah, so he was mentioning that in the tension revolution, after using the breath, he talks about uh, <clears throat> uh, the second practice is he calls settling the mind in its natural state, which is actually the practice of observing the mind, observing all your thoughts and emotions and so forth. So that's the second practice, which we briefly mentioned. And the third one is the awareness practice, sometimes called awareness of awareness. I just like to say resting in awareness, same practice. Um and so the second practice is you are consciously observing whatever thoughts and emotions arise in your mind. So when actually the texts say thoughts, the word thought is often a translation of the Sanskrit term vikalpa or in Tibetan dokpa. And those terms don't specifically mean thinking. It means conceptual activity. So when we say observing thoughts, thoughts is a generic term, meaning thinking, emotions, memories, mental images. All of that is thoughts, tokpa, kalpa, vikalpa. So that's the second practice. We're observing whatever arises in the mental sphere, conceptual activity, thoughts, emotions, memories, mental images. Whereas the third practice, the awareness of awareness or resting in awareness, you're turning awareness in upon itself and simply knowing that you're aware. So sometimes what the mistake is that people are looking for this awareness that they're supposed to be resting in. That's the Vipassana practice. So we're not trying to find anything. We're just knowing that we're aware. Because if you start looking, where is this awareness? You'll get confused because you won't be able to find it. And you think, I can't do this practice because I can't find this awareness. But that's Vipassana practice. In Vipassana practice, because there really seems to be a, an observer here, an awareness that's observing all this, yeah? Um, but it's the job of Vipassana practice to go, well, where is this awareness that seems to be here? Can I find it? So we're not doing that in shamatha practice. We're not trying to find anything. We're just simply resting in the experience of knowing that we're aware. That's all. And that's why people find it challenging because they want to find something or do something. That's the problem here. Trying to find something or do something is not the practice. We're simply knowing that we're aware. That's it. 
I mean, I think you know that you're aware now because you're we're aware of a, a, a clock, for example. So there's awareness there. So that's all we're doing, resting in that. It's very, it, it, that's why it's so simple. That's why people find it difficult because it basically involves doing nothing. We don't know how to do nothing. We always want to do something. So stop doing and be. It's just, it's all about being, that's it. We're not trying to discover anything. We're not trying to find out anything. We're just being, just knowing that we're aware. That's it, nothing more than that. In that practice, of course, thoughts and emotions and so forth will continue to arise. But now in this practice, we're not interested in that. We're not trying to block them. We're not trying to make the mind still. They can be there, but we're just not paying attention to them. Whereas in the second practice, we're looking at them. We're observing them arise and pass, arise and pass. So that's the difference between the two practices. Is it, uh, it, does the second practice kind of change to the third? Yes. Yeah. So what will happen naturally is as you're observing thoughts and emotions, see, now a thought or emotion comes up, we get caught up in it. We get follow the story. That's feeding it. So, you know, or if you try and suppress it, that's feeding it. So if you want thoughts and emotions to quieten down, don't follow them, don't try and get rid of them, just watch them because then we're not feeding them. They will just, over time, the mind will naturally become more quiet and still. And when it becomes quiet and still, it's almost a natural segue into being aware because all that's left is space. All that's left is space. And then if you sort of naturally turn inwards, you'll notice in that space is awareness. So it's a natural segue. And that's what Alan Wallace recommends in his one of his recommendations, breath, mind, and then naturally higher, we go into the awareness. You could have this thing that I, I thought there were fundamentally two different objects because um, that's what I thought. Because in the when we're just observing the space, because when the thoughts die out and you lose track of space, they they say that you can in, introduce a thought and then see that it pops up in that space just to kind of recollect. So I thought that fundamentally too different mm. because once the mind settles down and you're just in that space, so you do have awareness of awareness. So I think right, but it's implicit. Yeah, it's implicit. So the 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 recommendation there was that. If you're observing thoughts and emotions and they go quiet, you have the space and there's nothing to focus on, very much easy to fall into dullness. You sink into dullness. So to avoid that, sometimes they say as a beginner, generate a thought. But that's only a temporary measure. You do Later in the practice, you wouldn't do that. But then when, you, when it really goes quiet, you just have space. But then if you're very intuitive, you'll notice that space is what's the word coextensive with awareness mm. but it's not the same exactly the same thing but it's so close and that's why it's easy to segue to that okay i think i've got a question here in the zoom uh maybe let's have a look or not oh yeah would it be fair to say the traditional practice of mindfulness is best done on the cushion while during the day the more current of current approach may be more useful yeah so um what we're doing in meditation is we are strengthening our mindfulness by holding the object and so that's very effective and then we in during daily life we have to interact with various things sensory and mental things and so therefore the way to cultivate mindfulness in daily life is to just be fully present with whatever stimulus is coming our way. But what you'll find is if you just did that in meditation, sometimes people talk about this open awareness, you just sit in meditation and you observe whatever's arising, sensory and mental, everything. Good, that's helpful. But what you'll find is it's not as effective as a shamatha practice because your mind is moving between different objects a lot. So even though it's helpful, more helpful, more effective in meditation is narrow that down to one object, whether it's breath, mind, awareness, whatever. And that's effective. And then in daily life, then we do what's called this open awareness 
because we have to, we can't, I mean, if we're just sitting there focusing on our breath and then a bus comes, we get sort of get run over by a bus. It's not very helpful. You know, we need to be mindful of the bus coming down the road. So that's why we need to be attentive to whatever's in front of us. Any last question? Otherwise, I think we'll just about wrap it up there. Yeah. Um, so thank you for those tips. I think they're helpful. But to me, when I was reading all of them, you were explaining them, it seemed like it's more conducive when it's in a routine, like when you're when you're operating in a routine too. But often on that, or for people who have a less routine life, like there's a lot of travel involved or what how have you then ended this practice? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if you don't, I mean, if you have a lot of those things involved, then we had to be we have to be more creative uh, in what we do. And often with a lot of that sort of travel, there will be periods where you're just sitting in a plane or sitting in a bus or sitting in a train or whatever. Perfect time to put the noise cancelling headphones on, even a a sleeping mask and meditate perfect so we have to be a little bit more creative if we're doing that uh if we don't have a normal routine but i think we i mean we definitely can do that it just takes a little bit more creativity to how to work that out but again i think the key is that you know we get very busy very fast and usually what gets cut out is the meditation because we don't value it really because all these other things are so much more important but, you know, as Steve Jobs said, you know, we we don't want to be one of these people later in our life looking back and seeing how we sort of wasted our life in a lot of activities that aren't that meaningful. So I think we really need to reflect on our priorities in life, what's meaningful, what's important in our life, and not think that, you know, if I just, you know, work 80 hours a week, I'm going to be happy. And I think that's not going to happen. I think probably we're going to regret that later in our life. So, you know, sometimes we need to make some tough decisions in terms of what's priorities, what are our priorities in our life. That's why these preliminaries are so important. Because if we don't do that, chances are we'll just get swept up with every, well, everyone else is doing it. Must be the right thing to do. I got to do it. I got to work 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Forget about all these other things. I'll just do that we'll just get burnt out and then we're, we're going to regret it. So we, if we reflect on that and really think what is, what is important in my life, you know, and what's not so important and then shift priorities. And then I think things will take care of themselves. But if we're always just trying to squeeze in a bit of meditation here and there in a busy, busy, busy lifestyle, I think something's not right because maybe our priorities are not quite healthy. Glenn, uh, two questions. First, can this yeah. PPT be shared with, with us? What? This, uh, these slides can we? Yeah, I think this this it's all being Zoom recorded, and I can also make PDFs of all these slides available. Yeah. Second, uh, with respect to resting in awareness practice, is it also somehow related to Mahamudra practice? Is it sort of a gateway to the Mahamudra practice? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. So the question is, resting in awareness is that a gateway to like Mahamudra practice? Um, yes. In fact. You find it in the Tibetan tradition, both Mahamudra and what's called Dzogchen, nature of mind practices, as a basis for the, which is Vipassana really, uh, as a basis for that in the Shamatha practice, they very much recommend either observing the mind or resting in awareness, because that is what they're focusing on in Vipassana. So this is a very good segue into that. And you could find that simply resting in awareness as a Shamatha practice, you could intuitively come to an insight into the nature of the mind which is Mahamudra Zogchen practice. Yeah. Okay, I think we better finish there. We've run over time. So I'd like to, to thank Tashita Delhi for putting this event on today and all the volunteers involved. And also like to thank you all for coming along here today. And hopefully you got something out of it. And I hope to see you again in the not too distant future. Maybe we can go on and do the observing the mind, resting in awareness, shamatha practice. But I think there may be a, a plan or an idea for me to do at least an evening talk on December 2nd, because I'm coming through then, but it would be an evening talk, but keep posted about that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn, so much. And yeah, I've been asked to say some few things, so just to keep it up, and then we can go back home. Uh,
yeah thank you glenn and we hope that you come again as i said on second we'd love to host you mm -hmm. and thank you for the teachings i thought this was all and i probably say this all for for all of us that oh, it was wonderful yeah yes. it was sort of a complete sort of a teachings where we included <coughs> breathing practices and then how to inculcate in our daily life and how to maybe do some retreats if you want to on on our weekend so sort of a complete sort of a and we, we hope we can do the other two practices, Shamatha practices that we talked about soon. Um, and thank you everyone for joining in. We I think we also have, yeah, we also have some sessions coming up. Um, we have let me open it up. Yeah, so we have obviously this was um Glenn's teaching, then we